So in June 2009, NASA launched the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Its mission to map the moon in unprecedented detail. There's a fascinating story just on what is a sort of routine common object, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. And once you start using all the sort of like the, all the multispectral stuff and the gravity data and all that, it just brings up lots of things and it, you know, sort of makes you ask all sorts of questions about what's going on. Now this is Barry Fitzgerald. You met him when we talked through the Comet Striking the Moon video. He's editor of the BAA Lunar Section Circular and he's a prize winning astronomer. Now he is going to talk us through using the data from NASA's $500 million spacecraft to enhance our lunar observing. Now this is all available on the NASA Quick Map site. I've put a link below and it's in the description as well. It's been assumed that everything on the moon is, you know, sort of every um, I has been dotted and every T has been crossed, but far from it. There's lots, still lots to find out. Right. Let's try and find this crater. It's here somewhere. Uh, I mean, it is, it's a telescopic object, so I can see it in, in my telescope. Ah, oh, here we go, right. <clears throat> so here's uh, Mara ne uh, Nectaris. Yep, <clears throat> I can see the and other up, yep. Here we go here. So if you zoom in on this, so this is, so this is a multiple crater here. Oh, so I see the three of them, yes. Small, there's the larger one there. And that one, that one, this one here, and this one, and they're all lined up. Goodness so they're all traveling on the same azimuth when they impacted. And you can you can tell they're um the simultaneous impacts, or certainly this cluster here, because you've got this ridge that comes out, and that forms when the ejector blankets from each individual crater interacts with, with its neighbor. And you get those lines out to the side from, from simultaneous impacts. So all those were traveling in a line. But if we go to BERT, I think it's BERT A. Let's zoom out and pop along here. Right, here we go. And there's always been a bit you of a debate. You the moon like the back of your hand, don't you, the way you're doing this? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I spent far too much time looking at it, to be honest <laughs> with you. So, uh, so this is... Uh, so I think it's Bert and Bert A. I'm not, not too sure. I'll tell you what, I'll, let's just stick the nomenclature on it. I'll tell us Bert and Bert A. OK, so the debate was whether this crater, this crater formed after this crater, which came first, etc., etc. Right. Um, well, from this, you can tell that it's actually a simultaneous impact of a binary asteroid because it's got, if I go and put the... Um, near side big shadows or maybe it'll show it a bit better but from the sort of like the junction where the two craters are you've got these filamentous wispy bits coming out yeah. and that again is where the ejector blanket from the larger crater interacted with the ejector blanket from the smaller or the ejector cones as they were forming and it's it's you get these lines forming between the craters and they normally originate uh, at the intersection. So where the two craters um, uh, um, sort of join each other, uh, where they, um, uh, uh, where they sort of, um, the, it, it, the it's sort of like waves, of the, isn't it? They've, they've done that as they've met, haven't they? Yeah. Well, the, 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 you imagine two sort of cones sort of two ejector cones like that, and it's where they, so if you imagine my thumbs, the two of the, the, the ejector cones are actually interacting there. And the ejector, not only is it sort of like um, going up, it's, it's interacting and then coming back down again. So ejector can be an erosive force because you get the secondary, the material coming out and then scouring the surface and causing secondary craters. But the stuff that um, goes up and comes down uh, can also build up structures. So you've got, um, like around fresh craters, you've got what are called um, crater concentric dunes and you get this, these peculiar dunes that build up and they seem to be where the ejector is actually um, uh, building up. It's been deposited as opposed to eroding the surface. So it's a, a, an agent of erosion and an agent of deposition. And that's what you've got here. You've got the interaction of that those two ejector cones and they're building up these structures. Now with, with Bert, the interesting thing is 
it's a low angle impact because you've got you've got you can just about see it here that little ridge coming there yeah that little ridge coming there they mark the edge of the zone of avoidance uh so in a low angle impact you get the ejector being um concentrated cross range that's to either side and then downrange in the downrange direction whereas ejector is suppressed in the direction that the impactor came from, which is the uprange direction, which is this way. So the impact in this case, the impactor came from this direction here and struck the surface. So both of them struck. And so you've got not much in the way of ejector here and it's all concentrated here. There's one butterfly wing, there's another, and not a huge amount in this direction here. So if this is tra the trajectory, both craters are actually lined up along that um, uh, trajectory which is peculiar. So there must have been either tumbling one over the other, but along the line of that trajectory, as opposed to sort of like traveling one to the side of the other. So um, they're, traveling, so they're, they're traveling as a tandem, aren't they? Rather than traveling as a tandem, yeah. Alongside. One behind the other, one in front of the other. Now this one here, um, Thebit, there's, that's Thebit and that's Thebit A. And this was, uh, you know, Patrick Moore, one of his objections to craters being impact structures was that here you've got an old crater there and you've got a young crater there, but the young, the old crater is cutting the young one. So it can't possibly be an impact, you know, because otherwise the young crater would cut the old one. Well, this is another binary crater. So it's that, that structure there, but sort of flipped around. Oh, I see, yes. The reason this crater looked old is because it's covered in impact melt. So this, this crater and that crater were formed by a binary impact. When this one formed, it created, produced a huge amount of impact melt, which smeared all over this one and made it, it makes it look old because when you look at, the, if you look at the optical maturity, I'll go to the uh, Kaguya overlay and look at the optical maturity. And you can see there, so lighter is optically immature, so young material. Darker is optically mature, so it looks as if it's a much older surface. Well, the reason it looks older is because it's covered in impact melt. And that has got the spectral characteristics of mature lunar regolith. So it looks old, but in fact, it's the same age as this crater here. I'll just take that overlay off. And you get the same thing if you go to Burt as well. Remember, they're simultaneous impacts. We can see that from the ejector. If you look at the optical maturity, you mm. can see the dark bits there where it's lots of impact melt has accumulated there. And it looks older, but it's not. It's the same. So you've got impact melt here. That's darker impact melt here. Imagine if this crater had been covered in impact melt, it would look like an old crater. So in effect, like this one here. Goodness and again... God. I didn't know this. I've seen that. I've seen the straight wall that ironically is not straight and nor is it a wall. Yeah, yeah. Hundreds of times. I've obviously seen, you know, the, the sword hat because it looks like a sword handle, doesn't it, down there? And yes, that's I right. I didn't realise yeah, either yeah. side of it. It's just craters. I didn't realise they had such interesting geology, such interesting... Oh, this connection. one's fascinating. I mean, this one's difficult to make. I, I, I spend a lot of time trying to work out what was going on here. But a good clue is if you look at the... The mineral overlays and it just shows you what the um what the ejected let's go to uh let's go to try a peroxine um so it's worth uh, saying all this stuff's freely available isn't it on the um oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. this is this is the um uh uh quick map quick map so the lro quick map um i'm just trying to get let's try the olivine abundance um now, none of these are shown. No, there isn't. There is an overlay that I can use. Let's try adjusting it a little bit. And you can just get the the correct overlay. These these are you have to fiddle with these overlays a little bit to get them to uh, show the data correctly. Right, this one's better because I'll just reduce the opacity a bit. And you can see here, you've got the ejector that you've got the butterfly ejector from around this larger crater here on that side, but you've also got the butterfly ejector from that one here. Yeah. You haven't got much here, you haven't got much here. So it's a similar sort of low angle impact, 
to Bert. Um, and it shares its ejector. So this whole thing shares its ejector. So it shows it was created at the same time. It's a sort of it's a binary impact. Uh, one that sort of like really sort of in, encapsulates everything is Heiss A. And let's pop over to o Procellarum and I'll have a look at that Heiss A, which is a really nice one. But there are several examples that are like this. It's just a case of Bessarium B. That one's another binary crater. And now you pointed out, I can see that. Yes, you've got the similar that sharp edge. It looks like a uh, you can see the ejector all so it's got a common ejector blanket here. Um, and that straight septum between binary craters is again very characteristic. If you got to Plato Ka, which is up this way, oh, here we go. There's Heist. We'll come back to that. I'll just show you Plato Ka, which is over here. Again, a binary impact, but oh, the craters are sufficient. There, separate for you to see that that ejector pattern between them where the ejector cones interacted so that's very very diagnostic of a binary wow. so, but if we go down back to heist a um right where are i so you're like an uber driver of the moon you just know your way around everything i should get <laughs> out more to be honest <laughs> with you so here we go so this one's this one's probably one of my favorite craters it is an absolutely lovely one i'll just take that overlay off <clears throat> so that's what it looks like you've got a larger crater and a, a smaller one there if you have a look at the um optical maturity so you can see this looks like a much younger crater that looks like an older crater there but again the reason it looks older is because because it's covered in impact melt i'll just put the um big shadows on again and you can tell it's a, a binary crater because you've got these filaments coming off they don't show up too well here but if you um the selene images show those those wispy filaments absolutely beautifully um and they're very diagnostic of a binary impact now again this is a low angle impact because you've got your zone of avoidance here so the impactor came from this direction and again note you've got the big one there the smaller one there so they were tidally influenced to uh, adopt this configuration where they're traveling in tandem. Wow. Oddly enough, the small one, um, the big one impacts and the small one is downrange of it sort of thing. So something strange going on there. Um, and if we go into here, just show you evidence of the impact melt. Right, okay. So this, so this smaller crater here is covered in, wait for the um, layers to go. Um, this smaller crater here is covered in impact melt. And it, it was so full that it slopped over the downrange wall and formed this ramp. So that ramp was caused by impact melt flowing down, building up like a, almost like a lava flow that flowed out onto the plain. And it's built up a couple of levees there and there. You can see some impact melt there. So when it formed, this crater would have been full of impact melt and it would have been propelled downwards onto the mare surface here. And you've got a ramp there, Goodness which me. is you've built up by impact melt. You've got one of these. And if you go to the crater Arago, you've got oh, yes. something. I'll just zip over to Arago and show you a, show you a similar structure That's there. Um, Apollo 11 area, if I remember rightly, and the yeah, two domes. Here. And here's Arago here, and here is a, an impact melt channel coming out at five o'clock. And you can see here it's, yeah, I'll just try a different overlay here, see if I can get, get it um, a little bit clearer. But you can see quite clearly there, there's a, a this structure here, it's got these levees here and a central channel and an impact melt flowed out of the crater and down here. So imagine the crater when it formed, it would have been full of impact melt and then the walls start to slump. And if they've got a large slump on one side, it'll propel the impact melt up and over the opposite rim and it'll flow outwards. And you can see, you see there how it's, uh, how it's formed. Yeah, you can really see that quite clearly, can't you? And these things are, are 
they're not uncommon. So you've obviously got a massive slump here, which could have displaced a lot of the impact melt forced up and over in this direction here. You think there was a landslip on that northern yeah. western wall? So this this bit, this is a large slump here. Yeah. You've got the normal terracing here, but that would have been sort of fairly a fairly large, substantial catastrophic thing that probably occurred not too soon, not too long after the crater itself formed. So, so that's what I find fascinating about astronomy is that you know that's up there. You, you know, you you're seeing planetary geology formation of the moon. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, it is fascinating because you can you can go into you can go into this and you can. You can see stuff that you, you assume that everything's known about the moon, but it's not. It's sort of like up for grabs. I, mean, I just finished writing something for the uh, lunar section circular on um, on uh, uh, Piton and Pico, and I started looking at it and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and started looking at the the gravity data for um, for Imbrium and all that. So the conventional interpretation of Imbrium is that it was caused by a, an impact coming in from this direction here. And then it sprayed out all its ejector as it to form the Imbrium sculpture, which covers all down here. So that's the accepted sort of like interpretation. Impact coming from here. Um, and there's lots of papers being written. There's one written in 2016 explaining the Imbrium sculpture as a low angle impact. And um, the, 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 the impactor broke apart. It underwent something called decapitation. So it struck the surface and decelerated, but the upper part sheared off and continued off down range. And that those fragmented bits scoured the surface, which is believed, so the hypothesis is, to have caused a lot of the Imbrium sculpture. So when we go down here, we can see the Imbrium sculpture. So you've got all these tears and grooves and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, so you saw uh, the, the picture I showed you of... Um... The day you came, didn't you? You could really see that quite clearly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so the, it's supposed to be a combination of material that was from this decapitated impactor scouring the surface, and then obviously basin ejector comes and scours the surface again. But the orientation of the crater chains is slightly different. But when I started looking at Imbria, I was thinking, well, it's it's a bit odd, really, because you've got the Montes Alpes here, they're, they're offset from here, so it just it just didn't look right somehow. So uh, if we look at Mare Chrysium here, so this one is, there's good evidence that this is a low angle impact basin um, because you've got uh, uh, the rims here and here are higher than the rims here and here, which is typical, you get, a saddle shaped profile in low angle impact craters and, and larger structures. And if you look at the gravity data, so I'll just go to the grail overlay. And you can also see just while you're doing that, then there's that outer ring, isn't there? You can actually see, yeah, coming through on those colours. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And it, so, so here's the, the sort of gravity anomalies, and you've got a breach. So if it came from this direction, the impactor, and in that direction, You've got a shallow bit here. So there's like a shelf that wasn't excavated as deeply as the rest of the basin. And you've got a gap in, this is, this is um, a, a dense rock that's come up. Um, so it's the, it's the mantle actually, sort of like, as the, as the crust was removed, the mantle raised up, up in isostatic, isostatic equilibrium as it were. And so that's where the mantle has ascended. That's where the mantle has ascended as well. Um, but you've got that gap there. If you go look at another overlay, which shows the presence of a, a dense rock, you've got all these sort of like uh, semi-radial dikes coming away from it. Oh, yeah. If you go over to Imbrium, sort of, well, yeah, that I can I can believe the interpretation for that being a low angle one. Go over to Imbrium and stick the same gravity overlay on. What I've got is, and I was, just, as I say, I was just curious about Piton and Pico. And when you look at the gravity data here, Ooh. you've got a gap up here. So you've got a gap in this direction, which I thought, well, could that mean that it was a low angle impact from this direction? Um, I thought, well, if it was, that could explain why Montes Alpes is here, because that represents that shallow shelf 
that we saw in um, Myocrysium. So it's a part that wasn't excavated as deeply as the rest of the basin. Um, and this section up here, so with, with, with Myocrysium, the suggestion is that uh, Myomarginis, so this area here was caused by, um, so it's scouring down range of the impact. And I thought, well, if you look at this area here, you've got Mara Frigioris here, then you've got this bizarre bump that sticks out here of low lying terrain. So it's actually a, a slight dip. Uh, I think that could almost be analogous. So if you had the basin forming, but by an impact coming this way, <coughs> uh, uh, it could have scoured this and, and produced a, a, a bit of low lying terrain here through the same process that they're suggesting for uh, for Myocrysium, it was it was scoured away by possibly a a, a, um, a decapitated, decapitated impactor. So so anyway, I've, I've written an article. I'm going to stick it into one of the newsletters, suggesting that the impact came from this direction and not from that direction. Um, it's difficult with Imbrim because you've got a nice rim here, the Apennines. Yeah. Of course, you've got nothing there. It's it's gone. Um, but you have got lots, and you still have got lots of ejector up here, but you just got the rim missing. So whether the rim subsided or whatever, I'm not too sure. Um, so do you reckon they're two separate events, then the Apennines and the um, other mountain range? Well, or do you I reckon think they're the I, same event. I think it's the same event. I think the Apennines represent the uh, the rim. So the rim comes up along here, goes up in this direction here goes along the edge of uh, um, Mara Figuris and then comes back down through Montes Harbinger or, or the um, Aristarchus yeah. Plateau, because that's when you look at it in, when you look at the um, mineralogy, it's, it's, it's dominated by plagioclase. So these are plagioclase, so these are highland. So you've got all the highland material there. These are highland as well, it's, it's rich in plagioclase. So that's not an area of Mara, that's part of the rim yeah. of the Imbrim Basin. That's why and it's higher, it isn't it? That's why it's not flooded by all the lava, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. higher, yeah, yeah. And, and obviously you can see from here that Aristarchus is, is, is a, has excavated plagioclase rich material. So, I mean, it explains why it's a volcanic region because around the edge of the basin, you'll get lots of fractures and so, quite often circum basin fractures are sites of volcanic activity. That's why you get floor fracture craters around the edges of basins. So they presume the magma ascends preferentially through the lines of least resistance, which is the, 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 the fractures around the, the basin edges. Um, oh, interesting. And this bit here, so the Montes Alpes and this, this part here, I think would probably be analogous to this area here, which is the shelf. And you can see these isolated hills, which are isolated bits of highland material. So highland material isn't far beneath the surface there. There's a bit of a, a drop down there. And I think that this part, Montes Alpes, is analogous to that. So you've got a bit of a shelf here where the basin wasn't ex as excavated as deeply as it was. So um, they're just sticking up above the surface. They're just the surviving yeah. mountains. Yeah. And of course, this one... Uh, I remember I, I mentioned sort of like quasi radial dikes um, downrange. If you look at the, uh, let's look at the gravity data here, and you can see you've got all these heading off in this direction. That one's underneath the Alpine Valley. Um, so this could be where the um, the crust was fractured um, radially due due to the impact, and it's filled up with dense uh, magmatic material underneath. So you've got one there. You can really see it. It's yeah. a contour map, isn't it, doing that gravity field? You can really see the formation, yeah. can't you? Yeah, and, and, and here you can see the gap in the ring here. So that's that's the uh, the, the the ring where the... Um, uh, so it's like a, a ring of peaks that's uh, so be equivalent to the Rook Mountains of Oriental. And you've only got the little bits and pieces poking above. So you've got uh, Pico there, I think... Mm -hmm. um, is that Spitsbergen or whatever, and Tenerife up here. But Pico, it's it's not part of the ring. It's separate. So you haven't got an uplifted ring, but it's still poking above the surface of the mare. So it's a it's this isn't the deep, this isn't um 
you take that off and it looks as if it's part of the, the basin itself, but it's not, it's on a shallower bit. So it hasn't, so it's, it's not deeply flooded here. It's probably a surface veneer because the highland material isn't that far beneath, right. uh, beneath these Mari. So I'll just show you this, this other crater that I was telling you about, this crater chain. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, that'd be interesting. So here we go. So here we go. If I just put on the, um, the Clementine, Clementine overlay here, and you can see there you've got, so the yellow is the ejector, and it's all streak. The streaks are all going in this direction. So the impacted direction was from here. Right. To and that. that's yeah. part of the that's part of the chain. Then you've got this long sausage of a chain. And then at the end, it looks like a it looks like a Mickey, Mickey, Mickey Mouse's head with a couple of ears. Oh, yes. And if you follow the trajectory, you can even come to some disrupted bits further in this direction here. Um, I think there's a bit a bit there that's along the same tra trajectory. So I think it's probably a disrupted um, cometary type thing. And the reason I say cometary, it's not a solid lump like an iron meteor or a stony iron or something like that. Because if you look at the craters, they're very shallow, uh, exceedingly shallow, um, irregular floor. That one isn't, that's completely different. That's that's uh, that's more like a conventional crater. It looks a bit odd because it's knocked off a bit of the hillside. It's got an impact melt pool at the bottom. And so that's like a conventional crater. All the rest of them have got this bizarre morphology. So they're very shallow, irregular floor, um, very uneven. Uh, and and that's like a um, sort of mud pile, doesn't it? Rather a mud crater rather than a... Yeah, yeah, and the, the, the sort of you've got, I haven't got a central, you've got a central mound there. I mean, they're not very big. You can look at the scale. There's a hundred meters there. Um, very, very rocky, but there's no impact melt or anything else there at all. And if you go to, uh, so it's like a string of sausages, sort of like uh, short sausages. There's one there. There's one there. They're all quite square and rect rectilinear a bit like the Davy chain um, and between each one. So there's the septum between that one and that one. And coming out from the septum, you've got this wavy line, which is oh, the yeah. same as we saw in Plato Ka. So it's where the ejector cones or ejector um, uh, plumes from each individual subcrater interacted with its neighbor. And you've got several of these and they all emerge from the intersection between the component crater parts. Goodness me. Well, I never knew this. What, what a wonderful time. Thank you. It's really appreciated. That's, a, that's all right. Uh, and, and you look at experimental work and they, they, they experimented firing. I've got a thing about low angle impacts. So it's, it's my only vice. <laughs> uh, drugs and the rock and roll just don't cut it, do they, for you? Sorry? No. Drug, no. Drugs and rock and roll for you. Well, they did until I discovered this. <laughs> so, yeah, if you go there into, is. we've got the, you've got the straight scepter between the individual craters. Let us just try a different over. Yeah, straight scepter, you can see there. So these are very boxy looking things. They're probably boxy because each crater forming process interacted with its neighbour. <clears throat> and so the growth of the crater was maybe suppressed along this direction here. But whereas it was uninterrupted to the side, and you can just see the traces of those um, ejector patterns coming out from the intersections between each crater. And if we put a line, let's put a a line across here. Straight through the middle, isn't it? So this is a cross section. And that's typical of a low angle impact. So with low angle impacts, the, um, the uprange wall, so the direction the impactor came from is usually much lower than the downrange wall. And the uprange 
uh, part of the crater is much, much steeper and it's excavated much more deeply uprange than it is downrange. So if you go back to thinking about Myocrysium, the you had the shelf on the sort of like the downrange side of it where the basin wasn't excavated as deeply. Same with craters here. So the maximum excavation took place here and it was not as, as if the cratering process wasn't as efficient here. So that looks as if it shares the trajectory with this crater chain. So I'd imagine, again, you've got a large object there with a load of smaller objects in trail behind it. So with, why would one, if, one be so much larger than the rest? Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I don't, well, I suppose it depends on the on the uh, the constitution of the original body, you know, because most of these near Earth asteroids, they're rubble piles. And so I suppose, you know, sort of as it if it is, if it tidally interacts with the Earth, it could be disrupted. It pulls it out into a bit of a string of spaghetti. Just one, um, one is much well, larger, the original core, maybe. Yeah, so that could be the, the original core. And these bits are bits that have been pulled off from it due to tidal interactions. And then they adopt, a, you know, that trail configuration. Uh, there's a, a chap called Botka, who's a, was he a University of Hawaii, who did a lot of uh, work on disrupted asteroids, near Earth asteroids, and that type of thing, modelling how they would disrupt um, in, in, in the gravitational field of the, of the Earth and, and the planets. So, uh, so that's the type of thing I think has happened. It's happened here. That's what happened with Shoemaker Levy. You saw it, yeah. um, and again that that crater we just saw up in um, Northern Procellarum. Mm. and uh, and again with all these smaller binary craters, again they seem to line up along the direction of travel, uh, which is, is which there, is curious. These, you wouldn't have thought there'd be sufficient time yeah. for them to, you know, say if it was a, a, a larger body with a smaller moon travelling, uh, so it's, it's already a binary structure for the, for the tidal interaction with the Earth to actually alter the dynamics of its orbit to transfer it to the orbit where it's sort of tumbling one over the other and they're heading like towards the screen, which should produce the sort of like the um, the uh, 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 the lining up along the azimuth, as it were. Because on the video of Shoemaker and Evie Nine, they're sort of pulled out into like a, a string of pearls, aren't they? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah and the yeah. impact and, and Jupiter slowly rotating underneath. Yes, yeah. That sort of... If Jupiter wasn't impacting, it wasn't rotating, they'd all be impacting one on top of another sort of thing. In a line. So do you think so that's what's happened here then? That's the slow rotation of the moon. Um, I, I think with this, um, the separation between them is so close that I don't think the rotation would make any difference um, mm -hmm. because that crater chain would have formed in, you know, sort of seconds. Uh, so it's like a sort of strafing, a strafing run. Uh, and it wasn't, they weren't, sufficiently you know so imagine shoemaker levy nine it was stretched i don't know how long it ended up being stretched out but there was a con considerable separation between the individual components yeah. well from start to finish it was several days wasn't it there was hours between each impact i, I can't remember now to be yeah. honest with you but it, it was a protracted period you know as you say hours between them so, oh, wow. but this i think these things are you know virtually simultaneous so okay. almost instantaneous sort of like a event but there's lots of, there's lots of these crater chains or, or um uh, catena where they're lined up and i think there's far more i mean this one here could be a, a secondary crater chain so a lot of them can be potentially secondary crater chains and so you can really see just while you're on that view though that's the you were saying that's the ejector blast kind of like yeah. a cone these ones coming down here and say so these are supposed to have been formed by the um by the uh decapitated impactor that formed it and then a second wave of actually basin ejector that came so you've got two sets of scours one on top of another but in the article i sort of like suggested that you also get that in the you get that type of configuration in butterfly ejector type i'll just just before I stop boring you, silly. Not at all, not at all. Go on to oh, this. Yeah. We know those two, don't we, Messier? Uh, so you've got, you've got, I'll just get the, um, put the, uh, 
big shadows on here. So you've got here, is it going to uh, refresh? No, right, okay. That's not very clear. Let's go to, oh, well, you can see here, <clears throat> you can see here where the, the, so this is the butterfly pattern from Messier and all this material here, the crater chains are arranged almost like perpendicular to the, um, to the crater wall. Whereas if you look at this ejector here, it's out at an angle. And that's, that's what they're saying with Imbrium. They're saying that when, when the impactor struck the surface, the top bit carried on, fragmented and carried on, and produced a series of scours that were not quite um, in a straight line, but in a narrow cone coming from the direction of the basin. But when, if you plotted them, if you took a line back through all of those crater chains, they would actually converge not in the basin, but to the northwest of the basin. So they, the disruption happened a long way up range, whereas the Imbrium sculpture itself that was formed by the basin ejector was much wider. So you've got a narrow cone of, of scours overlaid by a much wider one. Um, and that they take as evidence for, for it being a low angle, angle impact from the northwest and an uh, disrupted impactor. But you've got the same sort of thing here, and this is the butterfly pattern. So you've got these bits here, and if you take these lines all back, they, they'll converge, they won't converge on the center of the crater, even though it's an elongated crater, they'll converge way off down here. Whereas if you take these, this ejector and follow it back, it will converge more or less on the, on the crater itself. So you can get this pattern in a butterfly ejector. So if you go back to Imbrium, Instead of that being downrange ejector on the other side of the Apennines, um, it could be just part of the butterfly pattern of, uh, of an oblique impact from the southwest. But, but this one, this one's a nice one as well. I just absolutely love this one. Again, a bit like Bert, old crater there with the new crater on top. No, nothing of the sort. Um, if I put the um, uh, optical maturity on, you can see why people thought this was a old crater because it's optically immature, uh, optically immature. That's very bright. Uh, so optically immature. So that's optically mature. This is optically mature. So it looks as if it's part of the mare surface. It, it's not. It's where the impact that formed this, the actual um, impactor fragmented and part of it slid along the surface. So this is where the impactor actually slid along the surface. So it's not it's not causing a crater, it's bulldozing material out of the way. You can really uh, see uh, that, can't you? Going from yeah, to uh, that. This is a this is part impact, um, part excavated by impact process, but also part bulldozed out of the way by material that slid along the surface. Um, and it's coated in impact melt. So this generated a lot of impact melt, and it's coated this. And that's why it looks older. So it's not a pre-existing crater that happened to be in, in the sort of line of fire, as it were. It's part of that impact structure. And this crater itself is actually made out of two. You've got the pinch in the rim there, and you've got a pinch in the rim there, the lower bits there. So this crater is in fact three craters. That's one crater there, that's another crater. That's a simultaneous impact where they virtually overlapped. And this bit here, is uh, another part of the excavation process where it partially excavated it, but also um, disrupted the surface by the impact actually sliding along and bulldozing material out of the way. So these are a lovely complex crater. And you can see this if you go to the, go to the diviner deet, um, overlay very quickly. Um, this will show you the uh, rock abundance, but I won't show rock abundance, I'll show you the, the temp nighttime soil temperature, which gives you the rock abundance. And so you can see you've got the red bit here, which is where the surface main retains the heat because it's very rocky. And so, you know, sort of a, a large rock will retain the heat much longer than a smaller rock. Um, and this is a nighttime temperature map. So I can show you the rocky ejector butterfly pattern here, and it's, it's um, swept in the downrange direction. So there's one that is associated with this crater here, 
these two creases there, but there's one that's associated with this. So it shows they are related, they're simultaneous, and that is actually an impact structure as well as that one. So it's, it's cool. It's, 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 there's so much, so much stuff that you can sort of come up with. It hurts your brain sometimes, but yeah. you can come up with a lot of, you know, sort of, as I say, it's been assumed that everything on the moon is, you know, sort of every um, I has been dotted and every T has been crossed, but far from it. There's lots, still lots to find out. So it's really interesting, isn't it? Because we can see this stuff in the telescope and we can go out and see Messier craters, you know, when the phase allows, but then you can go onto the quick map and actually analyse the spacecraft. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes. I kind of do it in reverse order. So I look at it on here <clears throat> and then I go out and see if I can find different things under sort of like, because grazing illumination will show you things that you will not see on here. Mm. Um, quite often you'll see stuff in photographs, amateur photographs that are invisible on spacecraft data. And so, you, you know, you, you combine visual stuff, amateur photography and this stuff to give you the whole story. You won't get the whole story with just spacecraft data, even there's a huge amount of stuff. Mm. So I haven't bored you. No, it you are awesome. I'm absolutely <laughs> fascinated. I love this sort of stuff. It, it's why I think I enjoy, oh, you can re and you can really see the sort of downrange ejector, the rays coming off, don't you? On yeah, that. yeah, yeah. For some reason, they're often downrange crater, uh, downrange ejector rays are often paired, which is <coughs> which is quite nice. I'll just put the iron overlay there. Oh, mm -hmm. oh that's, that's horrible. Well, I'll just adjust it a bit. And there's so many functions with this. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. You can see the two, two green, so the iron, iron, so that's, all, the red is iron rich, the green is iron poor. So you can see the double rays there. They probably show up better with in the titanium overlay. Yeah, there we go. So that's low, low titanium. So excavated low titanium material from beneath the surface. And you can see these double plumes there. Oh, that's amazing. Now, I love this because you say you'd see this in the telescope. And if it's the weather doesn't allow you, have a look at it on the computer and you can compare. Uh, you, it's like having a multi sensor instrument package. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there it goes. Oh, yes, you can really see that ray now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, a there's an, uh, there's a, this one's a quite a nice one. This is why I'm going to do the, um, the, the Winchester weekend. I was just going to do a quick talk on this. Alfonso, so you know, this one was. <coughs> I think we're still on the. I'm just seeing the blue at the moment. Has it come back? Oh, there it is. Yep. Got it. Okay. Maybe it wasn't refreshing or whatever. Yeah. So, this this ridge that goes across Alfonso, it was all, you know, sort of a, what is it? Is it a, 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 a tectonic feature? Is it part of the Imbrium sculpture? Da di da di da. <coughs> to work out what it is, you need to go over to. Cardanus and Craft over here. These are super craters. So that's Rima Craft. Yeah. But what that is, that is a crater chain and it starts here and it goes up in that direction. Yeah. So this is Cardanus here, I think. These are right. So, these are some distance away though, aren't they? If I remember right. Oh, yeah. 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 That's a crater chain that was produced from this crater here. If we zoom in here, you can see there's another crater chain underneath there. Oh, so yes. what you've got, you've got two crater chains emerging from this crater here. They're in a V and they converge up onto the northern wall of craft where they've actually disrupted the wall. So that's... Um, impact damage up there so it's two plumes of ejector that have carved out that crater chain those two crater chains and the material has actually struck the northern wall of that crater there but you can't see this crater chain here uh, and the material in between because it's been covered by proximal ejector so it's the ejector from this crater has smothered it so it makes it obscure but that is a v-shaped configuration of crater chains now if you go back to alphonsus so what caused that sorry that v-shaped crater chain because it's a low angle impact sorry i forgot to say this one this crater here yeah was formed by an impact coming from this direction here 
From the bottom. And okay. You, top, bottom to top. Yeah, bottom and that, to top. And you can get a bit of an impression of that because here's a butterfly wing of ejector here because it's 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 a positive relief so it's higher up here uh so the ejector was concentrated out this direction and out in this direction and in that direction there you can see the crater change slightly better so that was a low angle impact of course low angle impacts don't always produce asymmetric craters most low angle impacts end up producing a circuit crater they they, they look to all intents and purposes as if they happen from a vertical impact um so a good, a good example of that is if you go to the, just put this overlay on, okay, go out. So you've got, here we go, that's a low angle impact crater, that ohm there. So you take that off, it's more or less a circular crater, but you look at the, the ejector blanket, you've got that zone of avoidance there. So that was a low angle impact coming from this direction. And if you go on to this, uh what's this one called it's on the tip of my tongue but i can't remember so we've gone to the far side of the moon now haven't we this is the far side yeah, yeah. so uh i'll just take that off so that's uh there you go jackson that's right so that's jackson circular crater but you put they look at the ejector and again another low angle impact with a plume of material coming out in the downrange direction. So if we go to back to Alphonsus. <coughs> Do you see beautiful Mayor Orientalis going past there? Ah, uh, yes, yeah. You took the photograph off. Yeah, we Here's our apple here. So what you've got, you've got this ridge of material here, poking out from underneath it is a crater chain. So this is a crater chain that came from Arzakal because this one formed by a low angle impact from the south as well. And you got a crater chain up here, goes up there, and it goes all the way up here. And it's, it's like a collimated ray of, of crater chains that come out of the downrange uh, downrange from Arzakal. <clears throat> and there's a fantastic Apollo 16 photograph that's taken from up here and it's looking back down along this crater chain and you can see it, you can see it leads all the way back to here. Uh, and it's, it's beautiful, it's just such a narrow, narrow crater chain. Mm. Um, another example of that is, I'll just take the names off because it makes it a little bit busy, is uh, where's Stevensius here. Here we go, here's Stevensius. Again, another low angle impact. And you've got this crater chain coming away from here, which is the downrange part of Stevensius. It's got an elongate central peak in its broader cross range. Again, something that's indicative of a low angle impact. This, this is all proximal ejecting. It's covered up this crater chain. But again, you've got like a collimated ray coming up and heading downrange. And if we take a profile across here, get rid of that and start a new one. So through that crater chain, down through the crater itself, <coughs> and look at the profile, you can see that's the downrange rim there, up, uprange rim, sorry, and it's lower than the downrange rim, which again is characteristic of low angle impacts. You get that sort of like saddle shaped profile. That's the lowest part of the rim. These two are slightly higher and that one's not quite so high. So that was an impact coming from this direction as well. It gives you that crater chain. Go back to Alphonsus again. So with Alphonsus, with, with Arzakal, first of all, you had that line of craters excavating a crater chain, and then you had secondary eject or, or ejector coming out and being concentrated along the line of that crater chain. So this is actually ejector from Arzakal concentrated in a line. And if you actually zoom in, you can detect a bit of the herringbone pattern in that ejector that you get from uh, where ejector is being deposited simultaneously. So, so like around secondary craters, um, you get clusters of secondary craters, you get that herringbone pattern. You can detect that in certain parts of this as well, which is 
which is quite interesting. Uh, so that accounts for that, that structure there. And another thing with our Alphonses, that this floor here, we just go uh, put another overlay on. And this has been commented on, but nobody actually, as far as I'm aware, hasn't been explained. <coughs> you know, he said, um, uh, oh, that looks older than that because that's more heavily cratered than that is. You know, it was a bit odd, but, you know, sort of move on. Uh, and that was, that was, you know, there's a paper done in the 60s that sort of mentioned that, but didn't say anything about it. And there's another, another crate, uh, a paper recently where they counted the craters on these dark halo craters, so the small craters, to come up with age estimations. So they came up with the fact that, um, oh, these craters seem to be younger than those craters. How odd. So the crater counting um, uh, uh, technique that we're using is unreliable because it's given two different ages for the crater floor. Well, the reason it is because they are two different ages. That part of the crater floor is much younger than that part of the crater floor. That's the, probably the original floor fracture crater, because if you look at the fractures, they're all very narrow. These ones are whopping great big cracks. And the reason they are is you look at the gravity data. There we go. Not that one. I'll go to that one here. And underneath it, you've got a, a positive gravity anomaly. So that red stuff there is a positive gravity anomaly. Now, that, now if you get volcanic rock, molten volcanic rock ascending from beneath the surface, it's going to be full of bubbles. And when it gets close to the surface, those bubbles come out. And so the rock that it leaves behind is denser. And so that gives you a dense, a signature of dense material. And that is shows up on this overlay here, which, sorry, this one, which shows you where there is dense volcanic rock and you've got it, got it there. You so can really see that, can't you? Yeah. So the reason this floor is different is because it's had volcanic activity beneath it and it's been pushed up and material has been deposited on top. So that is actually a much younger surface. And if we put a profile across. So the results were correct. It's just the interpretation was wrong. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, um, here we go. So if we look at this, you can see this part of the crater floor is sort of like edging down that way. It's tilted because the whole crater was tilted um, as um, the adjacent mare filled up. The mare sort of like sank uh, um, with the weight of lava. And so the east, the western wall sort of sank with it. Um, but this floor here, so that so that you've got an incline on the crater floor, that one is completely level. So if it was, if that had sank as well, you that should be inclined, but it's not, it's level. So this part of the crater floor has been filled up with something else, probably volcanically derived material of some description. It doesn't show up very well in the sort of multispectral data, but it is there. You can there see the two different like surfaces, that. can't you, with that ridge in the middle, those deep... Yeah, this, this ridge in the middle seems to have formed a barrier. So whatever filled up this part of the crater floor didn't make it through there. I'll just put a line through the central peak. That's quite instructive. I'm really, I'm going to shut up now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and if you look here, the sort of like the, um, this material here is nice and sort of like flat, whereas this material here is sort of it's quite sleeping, rugged. And it's sloping to the left, isn't it? Tilting down. So this part of the floor has been filled up with something else, as I say, probably volcanic material or something like that, apart from which the floor has been raised because you had floor fracture activity restricted to this part of the crater floor and it's pushed up and opened up all these fissures. That hasn't happened on this side. So these fissures, which are probably the original floor fracture crater um, fissures, have remained closed or they've been filled in. You know, so they're not as apparent. So, so, you know, even something as familiar as Alphonsus slap bang in the middle of the lunar disk, you'd think, um, you know, uh, you know, everything's been known about it, but you can sort of put your mind to it and come up with, might be completely wrong, but it's an interpretation that's, yeah. you know, sort of valid and worth bearing in mind. So.
So I, I don't know how many times I've looked at Alphonsus and it forms that part of that really impressive crater chain. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a fascinating story just on what is a sort of a routine common object, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. And once you start using all the sort of like the, all the multispectral stuff and the gravity data and all that, it just brings up lots of things and it, you know, sort of makes you ask all sorts of questions about what's going on. And another thing is these off-centre central peaks. So that's off-centre there. This is off-centred there. Well, why are they off-centred? And when you look at the gravity data, a lot of the off-centred ones have a huge gravity anomaly on the opposite side. To um, So if they're closer to this wall, on the opposite side, you've got a big gravity anomaly. So this one, this central peak, Alphonse's, uh, Al Alzacle, that central peak is closer to that rim there. And behind it, you've got a gravity anomaly there. And so it seems to be an interaction between magma ascending from beneath the surface into the crater floor actually pushing the crater the actual floor of the crater in one direction Goodness taking me. the central peak with it so all sorts of things going on <clears throat> so you can really see there's different floors there isn't it because they've got floors that are quite smooth which yeah, are partially yeah. filled with lava and stuff that's still got the original um yeah, you know, yeah. formation in well, the assumption was these these were lavas. Uh, initially, I think they thought it was lavas, um, and they called them, you know, the, the Cayley Plains deposits. But when Apollo 16 went to the Cayley Plains to sample it, they're, well, they're not lavas. They're actually impact breccias. And so the interpretation of these Cayley Plains was their basin ejector. And so this is made up of basin ejector. Uh, and that would go for this, of course. But, you know, if it's basin ejector, the whole crater should be the same age, which is clearly not. Right. So this is a basin ejector, it's something else. So it sort of calls into question what these planes materials are, the light planes. And, you know, you've got our Zackle here down here. That's a floor fracture crater. Those, those aren't Cayley planes there. There's obviously volcanic material of some sort there, but it all looks fairly much the same, you know. Well, they've all got their own story, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. So I think I bored you. Shall I stop no, sharing the story? I love it. I absolutely love it. Else. So, <laughs> so. so Barry, one question for you then. Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. Did you see it? Sorry? Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you see it? What yes, were your impressions? Yeah. What were the impression? Yeah, what did you I, make of it? I was just amazed that so is I was using an eight-inch F8 Dobsonian is an old dark star one. So it was a nice telescope, I think the David Hines mirrors. And uh, Jupiter was in the west and um, stuck the telescope on it, brought it into focus, and it was immediately apparent there is at least one, possibly two dark smudges um, on, the, um, on the disc. Um, I can't remember if I saw any structure in the, in the, the larger, more prominent one. So, long ago now and I didn't make any notes but it was amazing to think that you know you'd read about the build-up to it what was going to happen and you go out and you actually see it in real time you see those two dark smudges one of the two dark smudges on the disc and they were so conspicuous you could not miss them so bear in mind as you know you know it was good good planetary Dobsonian it was a good telescope um but to just to be able to see them was just quite amazing really so, so the impact had happened, uh, hadn't it, on the far side and then it rotated happened. into view. Yeah, it actually happened. So the impact had occurred whilst, you know, that, that region was on the limb or behind the limb and then it had rotated into view. So it just, you know, oh, as advertised, there it is. Remarkable. And then that cloud, that impact <coughs> scar in the atmosphere just sort of slowly spread out, didn't it? Yeah, yes, it did. So it sort of like rippled outwards. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I can't remember how much I observed it afterwards. I say it's um, it's a long time ago now, um, but and I didn't didn't make any notes. Should have done. Should have done what you do, do drawings, yeah. and I'd have it. I'd be able to go to a notebook and say, "Well, there it is. This is what I saw." Next time, so we need another comet to go past. Them. Is that what you're saying? We yeah, another, yeah, I need another another one to impact Jupiter, which they do do. So, uh, but not a disrupted one. Yeah. yeah. Or an impact on the moon that leaves a. A, a, a crater that's visible to you know sort of to us you know telescopically that'd be I mean there's enough impacts that have occurred that are visible 
in the with using the um, LRO, the reconnaissance orbiter, so they've they've found loads of fresh impact craters that have been, you know sort of before and after images, um, which is, which is fascinating. Of course, people are recording impact flashes all the time, so which is which is interesting. So I think it's fascinating, isn't it? Because you go out in the Earthshine, you look on the dark side of the moon. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you're drawing a Leonids or the Perseids or the Geminids from the big meteor showers, then you can actually see, yeah. them, see the impacts on the moon. I think Tony Cook, uh, at the uh, BIA um, Lunar Section Director, he's a he's a lecturer at Aberystwyth, and I think he's got one of his students looking at impact flashes or um, trying to detect impact flashes. He's got a, a research project. I don't know if it's a PhD or something like that, but he's trying to recruit people to observe during times of um, uh, mutual showers to see if they can detect it. So looking at the unilluminated un un part of the disc to see if they can um, capture um, impact flashes as well. So there's a sort of like a bit, almost like a, a bit of a pro-am project in the offing there. If um, I think I'll probably that'll be in one of the lunar section. Um, it was, a, I think it was in the last lunar section. It was um, in the March one. Yeah, I remember seeing the March yeah. one. I put my hand up for that one if weather and <coughs> yes, yeah. now. Yeah, so that could be an, an interesting product. And the chap I work with, um, some do stuff with Raf Lennon, Italian bloke. Um, he, he's recorded at least one impact flash uh, simultaneously with some a uh, couple of Swiss observers as well. So you know, it's I think he uses a, a one thirty. Um, yeah, I think he's got a, a, a an AP one thirty or something like that. And uh, I, I think what he uses on the moon is a one eighty a Skywatcher one eighty Maxitov. So I think that's what he uses. So, you know, sort of not massive aperture things, but still sufficiently, um, you know, light grass to pick up the, the, the impact flash. So you must have a trade-off, isn't it? Because if you go, you know, a large telescope, high resolution, you're only going to see a small part of the lunar surface. Uh, no, and, you really, and you really need to try and get the whole disk if you mm -hmm. can, I, I suspect. But that's something I, I'll probably try and get involved in as well, well uh, with my cat out in the garden. Yeah, we'll put our hands up for that. I'm very conscious. I, we've been chatting for, when do we start speaking? An hour and a half ago, so I must let you oh, get oh, back. Oh, dearie me. Sorry, <laughs> oh, that, that's down to me. You shouldn't have got me going. Barry, if I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't have sat here for an hour and a half with my jaw open. <laughs> oh.